beautiful God, laying your majesty aside. You reached out in love to show me life, lifted from darkness into light. Oh, oh, oh. A king for us. Join us as we sing and uh Baptist Church. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for worship. We're going to ask Pastor Sam to come up at this time and uh, welcome everybody. Well, good morning and praise the Lord. Thank you so much for being here today. Good to see you. We made a few little modifications in our sanctuary. We now have it pumped up to 120 seats in this area, so hopefully there'll be room for everyone to sit and you'll have elbow room, room to breathe there in the seat. So if you get uncomfortable, feel free to move and we can still have you go downstairs to the fellowship hall if you need to and watch down there. Uh, I want to announce to the church council, the meeting scheduled for today will be postponed until one week from today for the simple reason we haven't heard any definitive news from our architect friend about potential building sites, nothing really to share there. So. We're going to try to get that information this coming week, and we'll meet next Sunday right after church, as we normally do um, downstairs. Uh, we always need more volunteers for Children's Church, so we ask you to be prayerfully considering that. And what we'd like to have is enough volunteers so nobody ever has to do it more than about once every six weeks. That would be ideal. And if we have enough, you know, we can send two classes out every Sunday morning, so please help us out with that. Uh, there, tonight at Awana, we uh, it starts at quarter to five, and about 5.15, we start a little adult Bible study in here. It uh, hasn't been getting the most enthusiastic response, and tonight will be perhaps the last time unless people show up. If you 
do show up, we'll continue it. If no one shows up, we'll terminate that uh, as of tonight. But we do it, at, we're doing some uh, Louis uh, Giglio DVDs, <coughs> and they're, my goodness, the guy's really good. <laughs> he knows stuff, and it's a blessing to watch him, so uh, take advantage of that if you want to. Today is going to be such a totally different service from what you've ever seen here at ABC. I've been here 13 and a half years, 13 plus years, and it's going to be different than anything I've ever seen. So uh, just brace yourself. We're going to have a great day in God's house today. It's, it's Orphan Awareness Sunday, and then we're also going to be doing baby dedication just in a few minutes. Right now, I want to show you three slides up on the screen. Uh, when the Dumitriou family joined church, I told you that Daniel is a very accomplished artist. Adele and I went to his home yesterday and took a few pics. And I'm putting three of them up here now for you to see. Uh, he, he not only paints, he does sculpture as well. So I'm putting up slides of three of his works of art. And uh, I just want you to see, uh, that's his daughter, her kitty cat. <laughs> this is a picture he has in uh, their dining room, living room area. Uh, uh, it's uh, Martha and Mary, the thing about serving, one kneeling, one complaining, you know. Uh, very detailed, uh, please notice the details. In, in, if you, it doesn't look so clear on that screen, but the little girl's coat there, Sarah's coat, it's just all the details, the wrinkles, the shadows, it's magnificent. Okay, next slide, please. This is a picture of the uh, Christmas birth of Jesus. One more is a sculpture he has on his wall there. It's an angel's wing. Um, I put that up here. I, the guy's got all that talent. He's making a living as a mechanic. Praise God for that. But I think he ought to be making some money with this talent, too. Uh, he's extraordinary. On Facebook, get in your groups and find ABC. That's all. Just ABC, which, of course, stands for Bobby. And in there, there's a, uh, an album. has pictures of lots of other of his artwork. And you can see many of them in, in much better detail on your computer than you can see on the screen up here. I'm hoping some of you will say, well, you know, I like to have a painting like that of my little kid and one of her pets or what's, you know, he's got pictures of his wife. You can see him. He, he's tremendous. I, maybe you'll get a chance to do some work with him and have him do some art for you. Are there any announcements I am missing this morning? You know about things that we should be talking about that I'm not bringing up? Okay. One of the big emphases for today uh, is Baby Dedication Day. So I have some people going to be coming up and uh, invite, the, let's see, the Browns aren't here yet. Uh, Foremans, Murphys, Rollins, please come up. We rejoice when God is blessing our families in church with additions like this. It's a special treat. Adele and I, we love little kids, and it's just such a joy when all these wonderful things are happening. And the baby dedication service is always a special time. Now, you and I know as Bible scholars that we can't really make any decisions here today that are going to affect the decisions these children are going to make when they grow up and become old enough to know the difference between right and wrong and make their own decisions. So during the dedication ceremony, what we really ask is that parents take a few vows about things, and uh, if they will fulfill these vows, we think they raise their children to be in a better position when their time of accountability comes and the Holy Spirit starts working in their life. They will make the right decisions if moms and dads will do the things that I'm going to ask them to swear to. And then at the end, there's a, a, an oath I want you as the church to take as well. Now, parents, I want you to understand as we go through these four things I want to ask you to vow to, I'm going to refer to you as being obedient, responsible, concerned, and understanding. I think those are things all parents need, and so you'll be uh, taking this oath based on those uh, adjectives applied to you, and hopefully you'll live up to them. So as I read each oath, you just respond, I do, we will, yes, hallelujah, whatever you want to say. 
This is your ceremony. Do it any way you want to, okay? Number one, do you as the obedient Christian parents of these children vow before God and these witnesses to raise these children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, teaching them by both word and deed that which God expects of them? All right, number two. Do you, as responsible Christian parents, vow to take, not send, these children to Sunday school and church on a regular basis, hoping to instill in them love for the word of God, respect for the house of God, and an appreciation for the benefits of fellowship with the people of God? You may have been in a place, someplace, where folks see Sunday school as a babysitting activity for Sunday morning. That's not the purpose of it. You take your children and Okay, in Psalm 78, verses 2 and four, through 4, we read these words. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Do you, as concerned Christian parents, commit yourselves to ensuring that these children will hear from you first about God's awesome love for them and of their need for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. I can't think of any greater joy as a mom or dad being able to lead your own child into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Number four, do you as understanding Christian parents dedicate yourselves to teaching these children that the primary duty of all human beings is to glorify God by loving him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and by loving their fellow men as commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Mark 12, 30 through 31. Thank you all. They've, they've said yes to all of those vows, and we appreciate that and praise God for them. Now, here's one for you, the church. We have the special blessing of having them here at this point in their lives, part of our church family here at Aviano Baptist. And uh, we're not, I'm not Hillary Clinton. I'm not going to tell you that it takes a village to raise a child. I think it takes a good family, and the church has a role to play. So... Here's what I want you to understand. Do you as the family of God, to whom these people belong at this point in time, vow to assist them in every way you can by praying for them, encouraging them, helping them, maybe even from time to time babysitting or doing children's church or nursery to help them in their quest to raise these children in the way that God wants them to do? Amen. Amen. I love that. Thank you so much. Parents, congratulations. Your children are beautiful. Uh, Deli and I hope always you'll let us be their great-grandparents while you're here at Aviano. Uh, I used to tell people grandparents, and they reminded me I was old enough to be the parents' grandparents, so we don't say grandparents anymore. Uh, it's a joy. Now, uh, we have a special music right now to commemorate this event. Liz Kitave is going to come and sing. While she's doing that, there's a little task here I want you to do. Right here are folders with the certificate in them already signed by me. And right here is a proper pen, a good one for signing. It'll start out with Foreman, then Murphy, then Rollins. I have them in alphabetical order. And as you do that, I'm gonna give you a New Testament. Now these New Testaments are for the children. Um, I don't know if it's the first Bible they're gonna ever have, but this is for Emily Brooks. And this is for Joseph Grant Murphy. And this one for Gabriel Leah Rollins, okay. One day, you'll be able to show your little children on uh, two November 9, uh, 2014. Here's what you were given at the time you were dedicated. While Liz is singing, you all just please, you get to keep the folder. I want you to keep these certificates nice and clean. Just open it up. Mom and Dad sign on the proper lines there. And then as you leave, take it with you, Father, Mother. Just like that, okay? Okay. Okay, Liz, please come. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine, for Thee all the follies of sin 
And you can sing anytime you want to, by the way. Okay, um, I've been asked to tell you if you're sitting kind of on the end or empty seats to the side, if you kind of scoot in, we have other people coming in and seem like you're trying to have a, kind of having a hard time finding somewhere to sit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make the preparatory announcement to, uh, right now so you will know. Uh, orphan um, Emphasis Sunday. We have three adoptive parents, sets of adoptive parents in our church. They're going to be most today. And the third one kind of came as a late flash to me. We got a third one I hadn't thought about. So uh, we didn't get her name in the bulletin, but uh, Erica Fluke, uh, Heather Ashcraft, and Kathy Westlake are all going to be speaking about their adoption experiences and what this Sunday means. And then I'll be up later to close that out. So I'm making that announcement now. I'm going to sit down and enjoy the service. So when all the singing's over, uh, whatever you've got laid out, Erica, just start. And when you all finish, I'll come up. Uh, just in a moment, we'll have you stand and shake each other. But first, I want to give you just a little call to worship from God's holy word. Psalm 81.1. Sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. When you sing... Really sing like you got the Lord Jesus down in your heart. You're just so full of joy you can't control yourself. That ought to affect how you sing. Now stand up and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. As you return to your seats this morning, we're going to sing 10,000 Reasons. We want you to sing along with us. Just remain standing as we praise and worship together this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. I sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up; it's a new day. Day. It's time to sing. Your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. I sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Your rich in love and You're slow to anger. Your name is Your For all your goodness I will keep on seeing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy like never before oh my 
sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and forever. Bless the Lord, all my soul. Oh, Just remain standing with us. We're going to continue to worship. <coughs> if you guys want more room, there is still more seats downstairs. Where I just came up from and getting more. Dear Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for today, Lord. We thank you for this packed house. Now we just pray, Lord, that we can each walk away from here, Lord, just with a deeper understanding of you and your love. And we just pray, Lord, that you take this small gift, Lord, this uh, humble experience of ours of giving back a portion of what you have blessed us with. God, we just pray, Lord, that we can give it cheerfully and you can use it to further your kingdom. God, we love you and we praise you. In the name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. Take me as you find me, of all my fears and failures, I feel my life again, I give my life to follow, by everything I believe in. is mighty to say
singing all the glory of the risen King Jesus. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing all the glory of the risen King. Shine your light. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing all the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save for us. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light. Shine your light and let the whole world we're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Thanks for singing with us this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning. I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk to you about adoption on Adoption Sunday. And our, our purpose today is just to raise a little bit of awareness about the orphan crisis that, that there is in the world. And um, I want to just introduce my family. I'm Heather. My husband, Chad, is in the, the middle there. And I have two biological children, Corinne and Abby. And our adopted little girl is three, and she is upstairs in the nursery. So... Uh, we adopted Riley through foster care when we were living in Texas, and she was adopted in 2013. And, and it is an honor just to talk to you about adoption because I think it paints a beautiful picture of what our Heavenly Father has done for us, giving us a new inheritance, a new name, um, the old is gone, and the new has come. And, and this is just an earthly, I think, picture of what God has done for us. Um, the decision for Chad and I to adopt was not the result of infertility. We have our, our, our biological children, and, and that was um, this was more of a, a heart that we have for the children that are out there that do not have the God-designed family that that he that he designed for us to have of a mom and a dad, and, and just having a heart for those those kids that are out there. And we, as you'll hear later this morning, there's various ways that you can adopt through domestic, international, or as we did through the foster care system. And foster care would have been at the bottom of our list when we first started looking into adoption because we were afraid. We were very fearful that we would take a child into our home and have them for who knows how long and then have to give them back because the goal of foster care is, is typically to reunify children with birth families. And, and we were very fearful of, of what that would look like for us, and we knew that it was uh, emotional risk for all of us, including the, the kids that we were taking along this journey with us. So um, that, was, that was a hard place for God to get us through. But through circumstances and doors closing, foster care was the, the avenue that was open for us in our situation. And, the decision to adopt was made over a, a lot of prayers, a lot of time on our knees, and um, just God getting us to a place where we knew we needed to trust him and that he was asking us to do something and we needed to obey him. 
and we needed to make our decisions based on that and not out of out of fear and any decision made out of fear it is not from God and I like uh, this quote by Mark Batterson who is a church in the he pastors a church in the DC area in his words he says most of us want absolute certainty before we step out in faith we love 100% money-back guarantees, but the problem with that is this. It takes faith out of the equation. There is no such thing as risk-free faith, and you can't experience success without risking failure. And I think for us that was just the battle in, in realizing that this was a risk, but that's where faith, faith came into the picture. And the lesson for us was as we walked this road and, and went down this path, God was able to show up in amazing ways and I think especially in our Western culture when we live in a pretty safe comfortable box we don't often give God the opportunity to perform miracles because we don't need him to but when you step outside of yourself it, it gives him an opportunity to show up and, and to do miracles and he revealed himself to us in a lot of tangible ways and I just want to take a minute or two to share some of those with you um, prayer was a huge part of this process for us and one of the specific answers to prayer in, in a miraculous way, we, um, when we were praying about adopting, our specific prayer was that God would put a bubble around our child and protect them because we knew they were going to enter the foster care system through some unfortunate circumstances. And just that there would just be this bubble, whatever was coming into their life would, would be bounced off of them. And we, as I have gone back and looked at, I've written down all the dates, looked, looked at how, <clears throat> excuse me, how things played out, we realized that we said that specific prayer, which was our heart for, for the whole process, but we started praying that about two weeks before Riley's birth mom went into her one and only prenatal appointment that she went to, full of all kinds of drugs. Yet, when she was born, her birth weight was very healthy. She was an eight-pound baby, and she's been developmentally, developmentally on target all along. And, and we see that as a miraculous answer to that prayer. Um, and that was in January of 2011, and we, we hadn't even started the training process, which was quite a, a journey of getting trained to become foster parents. Um, a, a second just miraculous answer to prayer was we were a part of a small group in our church in Texas and we did a study on prayer. It was a 21 day study where you very specifically outline prayers and are, are literally on your knees praying over those things for 21 days in just a, a, a very uh, intentional way. And Chad and I were just circling around this future child and just praying for God to allow our paths to cross in his perfect timing. And the day after we finished that 21-day prayer journey, we got a phone call from our caseworker about Riley, which got the ball rolling to introduce us to her, and we started providing weekend care. And, and it continued to be a long process, and she came in and out of our home for about four months before she was able to move in with us as a foster child. And we still didn't really know what the outcome of this all was going to be. So about four months after um, we met Riley, our church, another answer to prayer, our church that we were a part of there, our local church, did a 21-day fast. And we participated in that fast. And again, at this point, we were getting frustrated because we we were ready to move forward with this and and there was paperwork that was holding things up but um about a week into this 21 day fast we got a phone call that we had the green light to go ahead and, and pick riley up and she was able to move in as a foster child not as an adoptive child and so there were there was just many prayers that were answered in this process and she was adopted four months later after she moved in, which was very quick for the foster care system, on May 12th of 2013. And I did just want to say that even though we saw many miraculous prayers answered, there was a lot that were not answered to. And a lot of the times our answers to our prayers was wait and just trust. And I think that that's important because I think any part of, as you'll hear, from a couple other ladies, part of any adoption journey is waiting. And, and I believe after our journey that there is always purpose in the waiting and it's a 
a choice to try to find that purpose and, and to listen to what God has to say. Um, and as you'll hear too, there's, there is no adoption story that is the same. They're all different and they all start differently through different means and end differently. But um, the journey, it is risky and it is um, a roller coaster at times, but it also is an amazing opportunity to deepen our faith, your faith, in, in the Lord and what he's able to accomplish when we step outside of what we're able to do on our own. So thank you for, for taking the time to listen. And Kathy is going to, to talk to you about her experience next. So, um, my name is Kathy Westlake, and my daughter Gracie is right there. Wave your hand, Grace. Um, I have two adopted daughters, and I adopted as a single mother. And um, it, it was a lot of prayer that led me to the final decision. I had the paperwork on my kitchen table for about three months filled out, check done, the last thing was to mail it. And I just wasn't quite, can I really do this by myself? That was my issue. And then um, God just sent a sign to me. He sent a woman, a single woman with her adopted Chinese daughter, just as I was proposing to do, to Rhoda, Spain. She'd never been there before, had no reason to come there after, and came and talked to me about adopting. And after that, I put the letter in the mail and threw out the entire process. God has a brilliant plan. You just don't get it. But he has a brilliant plan. I was supposed to have a different first baby. Now, my first baby, Jade, she's a freshman in college in, um, at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire and um, has overcome incredible odds in her life. And when now I look back, I go, wow, that was a really brilliant plan. At the time, I was devastated because I had this little baby picture and I've been carrying it around for five months. And they said, all of a sudden, I'm supposed to go in June because I'm a teacher, you know, you got the summer to deal with the baby, right? And no baby. Oh, your paperwork's slowing and all oh, this and all oh, that. Well, finally, come to find out, the baby had contracted hepatitis and was very ill in the hospital. And they would not um, allow me then to have that baby because I had put on my paperwork, I was a single mother and needed a healthy child. So of course I was devastated. And um, you know, I thought, oh, you know, this isn't meant to be, I'm not supposed, and I was very, very upset. And my grandmother being a very wise woman said to me, Kathy, you're gonna get the baby you're meant to get. Don't worry about that other baby. We're all praying for it and we'll do something for it and you will get the baby you're meant to get. And guess what? I did. Because I was teaching preschool handicapped at the time and I knew a lot about autistic children and a lot about um, handicaps and developmental delays and my little baby was the queen of developmental delays when I got her, and, um, but I knew what to do. And it was hard work, there's no doubt about it, but raising any kid is hard work if you do, if you, if you do it right. You're, it's hard work, you gotta do it every day. Um, but the thing is that as she grew, her needs 
were very different than other kids. First of all, she was autistic, so we had to do a whole lot of special intervention. But secondly, she had these quirky little things that came up as she grew that really only a person who was savvy in developmental issues would recognize. Like, for instance, she had this vision thing and I kept taking her to different doctors and she would get new glasses and three weeks later she couldn't see. And I would bring her back to the, up to, oh no, no, she's fine, this, she's fine. Well, what she had was a special kind of growth on her eyeball and if you don't treat this in the right amount of time, the person goes blind. And what it is, is it grows into the vision area of, of the eyeball. And how you have to deal with it is with um, special glass contacts that are ground to the person's eye. So they take a topographical map of the eye. And of course, you have to find a really special specialist to do this. And my girl now wears glass contacts, specifically ground for her eyes. And if she loses one, we all have a, a heart attack because they cost about $250 each. But, um, <laughs> but she can see. Brilliant plan. If she was in China in an orphanage right now, she would be blind. Second thing to happen, she started getting this really, she, you know, being autistic, you kind of sometimes don't have the most sunny personality. And so she started getting very negative, very negative, very negative. And I, I thought, what is going on with her? This is even worse than her normal. And um, by God's hand, and it's a very long story, so I won't tell you all that, but by God's hand, I ended up getting her a blood test for something else. And what she really had showed up on the blood test. And what she had was an extremely rare parathyroid tumor. And usually people don't get parathyroid tumors, they get thyroid tumors. And parathyroid tumors are always only in older people and never cancerous. But in Jade's case, of course, my lucky little one, she had a parathyroid tumor on her parathyroid, but it also was beginnings of cancer and it had spread to her thyroid and also wrapped itself around her um, vocal nerve. And had they not been able to remove it when they did, and that was another part of God's hand that it got removed when it did, um, she would not be able to speak. And the, the um, surgeon told me, she said, if it was one more month, she, we would not have been able to get it off the nerve. And it was supposed to be a very simple surgery. And, you know, they told me, oh, 45 minutes, she'll be out. You know, after two hours, I was a bit frantic. And um, so I go to the, the man and he said, um, well, I can check and see. They probably just went in late. Sometimes they're behind. And then he checks in and he goes, uh, they're not behind. So I'm sure she's fine, but let's just pray. And he really was, and that was very calming for me. And sure enough, she came out fine, absolutely fine. She has to take one pill for the rest of her life. That's it. And think about that in an orphanage. She would never have gotten that diagnosed, and she never ever would have been able to speak after the age of, it was about 13 when that happened. So after the age of 13, she would have been blind and unable to speak. So it was a brilliant plan, truly a brilliant plan. And the thing about adoption is that um, when you adopt, you can also, just by your adoption, encourage a lot more other people to adopt. And in our family's case, um, it was that 
I, my brother and his wife um, could not have their own natural children. And she was very, very distraught, my sister-in-law, and so wanted to adopt. And my s ignorant brother um, <laughs> was like, oh, no, I want to have my own. I don't want to have anybody else's. I don't think I could love anybody else's kids, blah, blah, blah. Well, then I get Jade. And, of course, she knocks his socks off. She just, he thought she was the best thing. And then I get Gracie, and Gracie was a pistol. And he, he, she just totally, completely cracked him up. So one summer after we get back, my phone rings, and my sister-in-law goes, quick, give me all the adoption stuff. Dan has finally agreed. He thinks we could do it. And he has two beautiful Chinese daughters, just as I do, and um, they're four stair steps. And this is our, our low-tech version. It's called a picture, okay? <laughs> and um, <laughs> I tried to get it, uh, send it through the email to... <laughs> I, I just always get the errors. But anyway, so when, when you go downstairs, this picture will be up there. And this is a picture that um, Jade made this collage in part of a, um, a f slideshow she made about herself. And um, she writes, my family has been with me through everything. They never judge and they still love me. And a big part of Jade's progress was her little sister Grace. And so the whole idea of adopting two, in our case, was just such a blessing. And, you know, I, I was at dinner with somebody the other day, and they said, wow, it's like you really have a family. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I was, and, and so the other thing I want to say is a family doesn't have to have a father, a mother, and so many kids. It can have just a mom. It can just have just a dad. It's love is about what a family is. So um, if you're interested in adoption, talk to Heather or me or um, Erica, and we'll um, answer any questions you have. I'm going to try not to cry. I wasn't going to cry. It is truly one of my greatest pleasures and joys and most fulfilling things to talk about our adoption with other people and to talk about orphan care in general. And so um, our adoption journey began when I was in college as just a seed in my heart. And it came to life in 2009 when we saw a picture of a little girl. And we heard God say in our hearts, she's yours. Go get her. And so in 2010, we traveled to China to get Eve. And from that moment on, I was changed. All those little faces, the statistics and the stories, they were real. They were flesh and blood and running around my house in her Minnie Mouse jammies. And I remember holding her that first night in China and thinking to myself that there is nothing, nothing more worthy of my time and my money and my sacrifice than this, than seeing a life redeemed. I will drive an older car. I will live in a smaller house. I will not shop where I like to shop. I will do whatever it takes because she is worth it. And two years later, we felt led to adopt again, and we saw Joshua. And in 2012, we brought him home. And as I spent another two weeks in the summer in China, this time I held a different little child in my arms, but I thought the same thing to myself so profoundly. For with all that it took to get there, he is worth it. Today, there are close to 150 million orphans. That is a hard number to grasp. That is millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of little Eves and Joshuas and Rileys and Graces and Jades the world over. 
every nationality, every country, everywhere in the world, there are children that are left to fend for themselves. Famine and war and illnesses like HIV and even now like Ebola are leaving children without parents. In some countries like China, there's a government restriction on how many children that you can have and they prefer boys. And because of this, there are hundreds of thousands of children in orphanages. And some, most of them in deplorable conditions. They're underfed, they are untouched, they are malnourished, both in their bodies and in their souls. HIV and AIDS has orphaned 17.9 million children. There are over 120,000 orphans in America, while another 400,000 children live without permanent families. There are 10.2 million children orphaned in Latin America. Asia is the home to the largest number of orphans, 60 million at last count. But God foreknew all of this. He knew that when man fell and that when sin entered our world, that children would be left alone. And thousands of years before that, he told us what to do about it. He made it so clear in scripture what we're to do and how much he loves these kids. Psalm 68, 5, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. Psalm 10, 14, but you, O God, do see trouble and grief. You are the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 82, 3, defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed. And were that not enough, he modeled it for us by adopting us as his own children. In Romans 8, 15, it says, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. How our hearts cry out for our earthly fathers when we're young and for our heavenly father and when we come into his family. We cry out for comfort and for peace and for help and for strength and for purpose and for someone to make sense of life because sometimes it can be so hard. We look for someone to share our joys with. We look for someone to share our successes and our smiles with. We look for a soft place to land. We look for unconditional love. We search and we seek and we cry out to be loved, for someone to tell us that we matter. And these children the world over are saying the same thing every day, millions of them, millions of them. And most of the time, there's no one around to even notice, or if they're around, they don't. But here is where we come in. Here is where I come in, and here is where you come in. Could God work in such a way where every orphan's need is met, where their physical needs are provided for, like with manna every morning, where their emotional needs are provided for, where they just feel the love of God in their hearts and they know that everything is going to be okay? Of course, it could be that way. It could be. And I believe, because the Bible says so, that God is near to the brokenhearted and that he does tend to the hearts of these little children. But he also made it so clear in Scripture that we are to have a role in this as his followers, because while we live in this broken world, there will be unnet, unnet needs, and God uses us, you and me, to show his love and mercy to those children. How will they know that God hears their hearts crying out for food unless food comes? How will they know that they matter and that there's a Father in heaven who loves them if someone doesn't go and tell them? How will a little girl know that God hears her prayers for food and for love and for a family if we, as God's own children, do not welcome her into our home and feed her our food and give her our love and our family and God's love through us? How will she know if we don't? And how will they know if we don't? Will they grow up one day and open the Bible and read the verse that says that God puts the lonely in families and shake their heads and put the Bible down and say, it just cannot be true because nobody came for me. How will they know? If a brother or sister is without clothes or lacks daily food, and if one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but do not give them what the body needs, what good is it? James 2, 15 and 16. The beauty of adoption and orphan care is wrapped up in the gospel. In 1 John 4:19, it says, We love because he first loved us. 
In Luke 10, 27, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What if, like the Good Samaritan, we stopped, and we spent our money and our time and our hands to love these children? And I think of the other two ladies' stories as I ask you this question. What if we saw any inconvenience, any sacrifice, any life change, any waiting, any struggles, if we saw any of that as a chance to display Christ. To show a child the love of Jesus, not just tell them, but show them the love of Jesus by loving them ourselves when no one else did. Be it through fostering or adopting or sponsoring a child or giving to organizations that help orphans, we can do so much and so many lives will be changed. We have a choice. We can pretend that they're not there. And I've been there before. I've done that. It's really easy just to close your mind and your heart to these children. And we can say, someone else will take care of them, or don't I already give enough, or I could never adopt, my house is already crazy, or I could never adopt, everything is perfect. I can't bring in anybody else right now. It's just too stressful. We can say, maybe I've done enough already. But I ask you, how much is too much to sacrifice? How much inconvenience is too much? Jesus laid down his life for us. Can we not just lay down a piece of our lives to help them? They are worth it. And that's just it, and this is the wonderful part. Yes, there is a laying down and a sacrifice, without a doubt. But in exchange for sponsoring a child, we get to show our children what Christ-like love looks like. In exchange for adopting, we get to hear a little voice that was once abandoned call us mommy or daddy. There is nothing that compares to that. There is nothing that compares to that. We get to see a life transformed. We get to be a part of something big. We get to see how God redeems a life, and we get to watch it in our own living room. I know that God doesn't call everyone to adopt, but God does call all of us as a part of our walk with him to care for orphans and widows in their distress, as James said. And what I'm asking you to do today is just to ask God, just ask him, what do you have for our family? How would you like us to care for these children that are so clearly, so close to your heart, God? What do you want us to do? It might be to pray with deeper conviction for these children. And if it is, pick a child from a website, put them on your refrigerator and pray. It might be to sponsor a child through an orphan organization. It might be to support other adoptive families in so many ways, emotionally, physically, and even some families financially, as adoption is an expensive endeavor. And it might be to bring a little child home yourself. And if God is putting it on your heart, then I just say to you, don't be afraid. Do it. Do it. Um, the Lord will go before you. He will bless what you give. He will bless your offering of your money, your time, your house, your home, your family, whatever your offering is, he will bless it, and he will use it to help these children. We're going to leave you with a short video today, and after the service, the girls and I will be downstairs, and we have some resources for you. We brought some pictures. We brought our favorite adoption books. We have a handout. If anyone just wants more information or just wants to chit-chat or wants to know how you can help orphans outside of adoption, we will be downstairs after. Thank you so much for this chance to share our heart with you. We appreciate it.